Welcome to Unit 3 in AP Psychology on the biological basis, right, when we're talking about the very sciency like stuff of the course being um, the nervous system and everything involved with how we biologically function and how that contributes to our behavior and our mental processes. So I wanted to first start by showing you the set of notes that you should be working on. This is the piece of paper and it'll have like some blocks out to the side to label this um, this neuron here and we'll go through what all those parts are and then there's also more specifics on um, the neuron itself and we'll go over all of that. So this set of notes being on the neuron itself as the basis of our nervous system, right? It is the smallest, most basic unit of the nervous system uh, and we're going to go over all of the parts. So this is kind of a real life picture over here on the right of the neuron. The photograph made with the aid of an electron microscope reveals actual cell bodies, dendrites, and axons in a cluster of neurons. And notice that it's it seems kind of crazy, right? But it's exactly what it looks like. So on the left here is a little more organized and not real life in the aid of an electron microscope, but it allows us to kind of see the parts a little bit better. So the finger-like tentacle-looking strings almost up at the top of the neuron are dendrites. Okay, so the dendrites are all around here on the neuron. They receive information from other neurons and sensory receptors. Okay, so they are the receiving part of the neuron. So they receive the message and dendrites then send it to the cell body, which is the big, big part of the neuron. It contains the nucleus. So if you look on the picture on the right, that would be each of these bigger chunks in the neuron. That's the cell body, not as circular and pretty as over here, right? In the center is the nucleus. I'm sorry, in the cell body is the nucleus. It provides energy for the neuron to carry out its functions, okay? So the nucleus is what then says, okay, go ahead and fire, send the message down the next part, which is the longest part of the neuron, and that's all of this here is the axon. The axon carries neurons message to other body areas, okay? These can be very long. They can be shorter too, but they're the long skinny part. So over here, this part coming off of the soma would be the axon, right? This part coming off of the soma would be the axon. The little blue part um, or parts that go down the axon, this is called myelin sheath. Um, it's present on the axons of some neurons and it increases neuron communication speed. You should make a note on what myelin is. Myelin is just simply fatty tissue, okay? It's, it's just fatty tissue that insulates the um, longest part of the neuron, the axons, and it speeds up the transmission of the message down the axon. The points in between the myelin sheath, notice that they're kind of separated. The points in between the myelin sheath are called nodes of Ranvier. It's the gap in the myelin sheath, that's all it is. Um, the reason why myelin sheath allows the neural message to be sped up is because um, the message is able to kind of skip or go faster through the parts with the myelin sheath and just depolarize in the different areas of the nodes of Ranvier. Um, you should also know that the, in a myelin sheath, so if we're looking at this part, this myelin of the axon and it enlarges over here to the right, this would be an enlarged myelin, okay? This purple spot would be a Schwann cell. It's a non-neural cell that generates the myelin, okay? So a Schwann cell generates the myelin. So you should have your entire neuron at the top or on the first page of your notes completely labeled. So now you're gonna go on to the next page where we talk about how the neuron communicates. It is a standard a set by College Board that says you have to know all the parts and how they function of a neuron and then also the firing process and neural communication and what that network looks like. Resting potential. Resting potential is when a neuron is just resting. It's just sitting there. It is not firing. In order to know more about the firing process of a neuron, you need to know what it's like when it rests. Okay, so resting potential. This is the imbalanced electrical charge of the axon in its inactive state. So when the neuron is ready to fire, it's just waiting to receive the message. The inside of the cell is of a relatively negative charge. Okay, so if this white kind of rectangle here is the axon of the neuron, it is a negative charge. 
whereas it's positive charge on the outside. Okay? You'll notice that there's K, potassium on the inside, and sodium on the outside. So again, the biggest thing they have to understand is that potassium's on the inside, but that it has a negative charge, and then that so sodium's on the outside, and there's a positive charge on the outside of the neuron. This is called polarization, by the way, in that it's all negative ions on the inside and positive on the outside, meaning that opposites, positive and negative, are away from each other. They are polarized. So the typical neuron receives hundreds of messages. Okay, some of these messages are excitatory and they say fire, while others are inhibitory. They say don't fire. Okay, here's the reason why. We have a billion neurons in our head, no joke, billions. And in order for me to take my hand and put it on my computer mouse, it takes a very complex network of neurons. I don't want a network of neurons that would let my left hand then pick up my cell phone. So the certain neurons that it takes to pick up my right hand to put my hand on the mouse, it's going to send excitatory messages to those neurons, whereas it, if it's then going to send inhibitory messages to neurons that they don't want to fire. Okay? So when there are more excitatory than inhibitory messages, the cell body exceeds its threshold and creates an electrical impulse. So as long as there are more E's here than there are I's, the soma and nucleus will say, go ahead and fire, we've met our threshold. So what's this action potential thing? So a neural impulse is all it is. Action potential is simply the neural impulse that goes down the axon of the neuron. It's a neural impulse that consists of a brief electrical charge, it is electrical, just like electricity, that travels down the axon generated by the movement of positively charged atoms in and out of the channels in the axon's membrane. And we're gonna talk about what these channels are. It's simply like a doorway in. You can't just walk through a wall, just like an ion can't walk through a wall of a neuron, okay? A couple of um, principles to understand here with action potential. The all or nothing response. When depolarizing, meaning when the positive ions rush into the neuron and it is depolarized, hence there's positive and negative ions together, which is not homeostasis, so the neuron like freaks out, right? And it sends the electrical charge. So when depolarizing um, current exceeds the threshold, a neuron will fire, right? So as long as it's excitatory, overcoming inhibitory, it fires. Um, and below the threshold, it will not. There is no halfway point. It's either going to fire all the way or not at all. Intensity or strength of an action potential remains constant throughout the length of the axon. In other words, it doesn't get weaker or it doesn't get stronger as it goes down the axon. It remains constant. So let's talk about this depolarization beast. Depolarization occurs when positive sodium NA ions enter the neuron, making it more susceptible to fire and action potential. Okay, so sodium rushes in and depolarization. The refractory period, after a neuron has fired an action potential, it pauses for a short period to recharge itself to fire again. At this time, the inside potassium ions move out of the cell, and the neuron can't fire until the sodium goes out and the potassium comes back in. Okay, so it's that whole process of essentially the neuron going back to homeostasis in order for it to fire. You have this, um, these images on your notes and you do need to label it, okay? So if you look up at the very, very top here is the full neuron, right? In this little box, it's taking a part of the axon and enlarging it over here. And notice it's a tubular shape, right? And they kind of take a chunk out of the side of it and they take you into essentially the wall of the, ner or of the axon and they enlarge it down here in this first picture. So you'll see that the sodium ions are the little orange balls up here, right? Mostly positive charge on the outside. Now, these little orange holes, you could say, in the wall of the axon are the sodium channels. They open and sodium ions rush in. Hence, the, uh, the axon or neuron starts to depolarize. So the sodium ions come in through the channels into the inside 
of the axon. So then the next image shows you the potassium ions. Potassium channels, remember potassium being the little blue balls here, are in the inside of the neuron at resting potential. So when sodium rushes in up here, okay, um, the potassium channels open and potassium ions rush out of the axon. So the first sodium channels have closed back here, notice. Um, but those farther down the axon open, carrying the movement of depolarization along. And the best way I can think to explain that is like the domino effect. Okay, so if you set up all of your dominoes, think of each domino being the sodium rushing in and potassium rushing out. As the um, sodium comes in and potassium goes out, each domino falls down and causes the chain reaction of the action potential to go down the line of dominoes or down the line of the axon. So other action potential if info. So this graph here on the left, it depicts the change with time in the electrical charge across a given point on the axon membrane as action potential passes through that point. Notice how darn quick it is. So to transmit the message, the length of the axon takes less than one hundredth of a second. It's super, super duper fast. So with each action potential, a small amount of sodium enters into the cell and a small amount of potassium leaves it. To maintain the original balance of these elements, each portion of the axon has a sodium potassium pump that continuously moves sodium out of the cell and potassium in bringing it essentially back to homeostasis. So the neural flushing experiment, if you would go to your bathroom, um, you can see many parallels between how a toilet functions and how a neuron functions. And it'll show you things like the all or nothing principle. You either flush the toilet all the way or not at all. It'll also show you reuptake in that the bowl of the toilet has to refill just like the axon of a neuron has to go back to homeostasis before it can fire again, right? So that would be, I'm sorry, not reuptake, but refractory period. So that would show you refractory period. So let's look more specifically at the rest of the parts of the neuron, the biggest one being the synapse. This is also called the synaptic, synaptic gap or synaptic cleft, okay, but for time's sake we'll say synapse. It's a junction, it's a gap between the axon tip or axon terminal buds of the sending neuron and the dendrite or cell body of the receiving neuron. So this tiny gap between each of the neurons is called the synapse. And I just remembered you also needed to label on your neuron on the first page, axon terminal buds. So on your vertical neuron that you have on your page down at the bottom, the very end points are called axon terminal buds. Okay, those are what send the message across the synaptic gap. Okay, there is a gap. Neurons never touch. There is always a gap between them. Neurotransmitters are the chemicals, you could call them electrochemicals, that kind of jump the synaptic gap. So these neurotransmitters are released from the sending neuron, hence in this image here, this is the sending neuron up top. They travel across the synapse and they bind to receptor sites on the receiving neuron. So if this part down here is the receiving neuron, there's little ports, you could say, or doors for each type of neuron and they will fit into their exact receptor sites made for them. So thereby influencing it to generate an action potential and to continue communicating the message. Reuptake, this is a process that's incredibly important to our biology, right, and neural firing. Neurotransmitters in the synapse, if they are left over, right, so the receiving message, or I'm sorry, the sending neuron will send the message if there's any leftover neurotransmitters, you really only need them to fit in the receptor sites once. If there's leftover neurotransmitters, like these here in the synapse, um, they'll be reabsorbed back up, hence reuptake, into the sending neurons through the process of reuptake. So it basically has the effect of turning the volume down on the message being transmitted between neurons because it's been sent, so you don't need to send the message again.
Once the neurotransmitters have done their job, reuptake keeps the message from being sent again.